Here is the brief history of programming languages. In the 2010s, you can find all the resources and visuals I used in the description below. We start out in 2010 with the emergence of Rust, believed to be named after the Rust fungi family. Originally a personal side project of Graydon Ware at Mozilla in 2006, and eventually being sponsored by Mozilla in 2009. Rust was designed to support large-scale concurrency, safety, memory layout, and overall system integrity. So with all these languages uh, coming out, you might ask, okay, what, you know, what is sort of special about Rust? Why Rust? Why is Mozilla building Rust? Um, so the, the kind of headline for Rust is safe systems programming. Since Rust was designed around memory safety, Rust actually does not permit null or dangling pointers. Speaking from personal experience in my C and Java computer science classes in college, that is a very valuable feature. But Rust does not implement any automated garbage collection and rather opts for a deterministic management of resources. In 2011, the tech all-father Google released Dart. As most things published by Google, Dart had a very specific purpose and was primarily created for writing apps on multiple platforms and focuses on client optimization. For all my Java and C fans out there, Dart features C-style syntax and garbage collection, as well as being object-oriented. Interestingly enough, Dart can actually compile to JavaScript in order to support running on popular web browsers. For my mobile app developers out there, you may have heard of the Flutter Framework SDK, which was also released by Google and actually written in Dart. If we were talking about family trees, Dart is yet another child of the Algol programming language family, alongside its older siblings C and Java. Now for one of the most requested programming languages. Also in 2011, while Dart was darting around app platforms, the programming language Kotlin was released by the Czech software development company JetBrains. Kotlin is more of a general purpose type programming language, but primarily used in Android app development alongside Java. Kotlin and Java are actually very much intertwined as Kotlin is primarily targeted to the JVM or the Java Virtual Machine to compile Java code regardless of the device, as well as work in conjunction with Java code, and Kotlin even relies on the Java standard library. Additionally, it's not uncommon to mix both Kotlin and Java together in the same project, but you can't quite use their syntax interchangeably yet. Uh, so it will use the uh, Java to Kotlin converter built into the IDE and uh, uh, do it for me. So boom, there it is. Uh, a single line that's actually all you needed uh, to declare one class, two properties. If you want to get started developing some Android apps and dive deeper into Kotlin or Java, you can download Android Studio for free, this isn't an ad, and try your luck at becoming the next app millionaire. Moving to 2012, the programming language Elixir was released, originally created by Jose Vallum. Now, this isn't any old regular magic elixir that you might find at your bi-weekly Friday night dungeon and dragon sessions. Elixir is another general purpose and functional programming language but mainly focus on handling large amounts of data. It targets the Beam Virtual Machine, which is a part of the Erlang runtime system. Vallum envisioned Elixir because he wanted better productivity and extensibility, whilst keeping the benefits of the Erlang ecosystem compatibility. So one of the big things about Elixir and that we get exactly from building on top of the Erlang VM is that we can write distributed software, software that runs in more than one machine. At the time, Vallum was a Ruby developer and chose some features from Ruby when first creating Elixir. One interesting bit about Elixir is its fault tolerance protocol that basically utilizes programmatic supervisors to monitor and suggest restarts when encountering a problem. Fellows over at Microsoft, specifically Anders Helsberg, released TypeScript in 2012 and had influence from C Sharp, Java, and JavaScript. TypeScript was created as a syntactical superset of JavaScript, which basically just means it encapsulates all of the syntax of JavaScript while adding more, most notably static type definitions. Therefore, definitionally wise, all JavaScript files are technically TypeScript files. It was also birthed out of some of the downsides of JavaScript, specifically large-scale software development. This, in a nutshell, is, is, is why we're here, right? Um, <laughs> JavaScript is a great language, but it has issues, uh, and, and it needs tooling if you want it to scale. And really, that was sort of like the, the insight that, that we, and not just we, but many, uh, had you know, years and years ago, and that was in a sense what, what, what got us started. TypeScript is open source. If you want to go poke around and similar to Dart, TypeScript can compile to JavaScript and features a pretty unique definition file feature that sort of acts like a C++ header file. TypeScript 4.0 was recently released on August 20th, 
2020. Around the same time in 2012, the dynamic programming language Julia was released. Similar to some other mathematical programming languages like MATLAB, Julia really shines when it comes to numbers and general computational science problems. I'm a, a co-founder, co-inventor of a programming language known as Julia. Perhaps some of you have used it. And this language uh, is become increasingly popular for all of the various kinds of models that will be coming up in the various talks today, the climate models, the economic models, the various political models, uh, and so forth. Julia features a lot of big science words like parametric polymorphism, multiple dispatch paradigms, parallel and distributed computing, eager evaluation, and some other math science stuff. Julia utilizes a just-in-time compiler, which compiles all Julia code to machine code before actually executing it. Jeff Bexenson, Stefan Karpinski, Viral B. Shaw, and Alan Edelman were the main crew to formulate Julia, and you may be asking yourself, where they got that name. Maybe it was one of their beloved partners or children. Perhaps a cherished grandmother or a clever acronym. Well, no, they just like the name Julia. Now, if you wanna be an investment banker, you might wanna pick up Julia as a side project, as it was used at both BlackRock for time series analytics and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to make models of the US economy, which according to them was 10 times as fast as the MATLAB counterpart. That's right, take that MATLAB, making me look up matrix documentation to finish my math homework. Now we are going to hop our way over to Hopscotch, released in 2013 by Hopscotch Technologies. Similar to the children's game it gets its name from, Hopscotch is a visual programming language specifically designed for young and new programmers. Its UI allows for dragging and dropping code blocks and scripts to foster early education in programming patterns and paradigms. But since its focus is fairly narrow, it's not really used in any serious computation or applications. Plus, the way you actually utilize Hopscotch is primarily through their iOS app. It was also featured on Shark Tank, so uh, invest while you can. In 2013, we get Cuneiform. Not this, but this. Created by Jorgen Brandt. The original Cuneiform was open source, and so was this one specifically targeted at large volume scientific data analytics, as well as parallel computing. So what we're facing today uh, uh, in the field of uh, bioinformatics, and especially in next generation sequencing, is that there's uh, coming up a new kind of hardware which is uh, capable of producing data extremely fast. Also, you can operate it very, very well in parallel. It's natural to say uh, that if we can uh, generate this uh, data in parallel, we also have to uh, analyze it. Since Cuneiform is primarily a programming language for mathematics and scientific computation, it's a functional programming language and interestingly enough, Cuneiform is also Turing complete. Now I still get confused on what being Turing complete actually means, but it basically means that it can simulate any Turing machine, and a Turing machine is a whole other history video, but without getting too deep, essentially it's a theoretical mathematical machine that uses a tape and rule sets to do stuff. So throw it back to the early bronze era and take a dip into the cuneiform programming language. Now we are gonna skip ahead a bit to 2014. While you were listening to Steal My Girl by One Direction, and I know you were, Facebook released Hack, not the Netflix documentary The Great Hack, and at this point, that name sort of aged poorly. Hack, and I'm not making this up, targets the hip-hop virtual machine. Maybe the developers were listening to 2014 music while writing it. Ultimately, Hack is a variant of the popularly memed on web development language PHP. Talking about PHP. And um, so I picked a random PHP developer. You might have recognized him. And uh, he was trying to build something, right? Back then in 2004, he was trying to build something called the Facebook. And um, he picked a technology to do that that was PHP. And we think that it has been a really good choice. Before releasing it to the public, Facebook integrated Hack into its Facebook in order to stress test its web development and large scale capabilities. Hack supports both dynamic and static typing and even has instantaneous type checking, periodically checking files while they're being edited. All right, for this next one, we're gonna do a British slash Australian narration voice, so uh, buckle up. <clears throat> in a classic tech rivalry, Swift was also released in 2014 by the big lads and lassies over at Apple. Now I've covered Swift before, so I'll keep it brief. Prior to Swift, Objective-C was the primary programming language in many Apple products. But just like removing the headphone jack, Swift was designed to replace the older Objective-C and introduce more modern programming features. Objective-C has served us so well for 20 years, we absolutely love it. But we had to ask ourselves the question, what would it be like if we had Objective-C without the baggage of C. 
Since so much of the existing code at Apple was written in Objective-C, they couldn't just do a hard swap. So Swift was designed to interoperate and coexist with Objective-C code and specifically within Apple products, Swift utilizes the Objective-C runtime library, which ultimately means that within a single program, Swift, Objective-C, and even C can operate. Swift is the main programming language for writing iOS applications, and from personal experience, it's quite easy to read and pick up. And one interesting point, Swift doesn't reveal unsafe accesses like pointers to avoid those pesky no pointers. To pick up the pace a little bit, we are gonna to move to Ballerina in 2017. Originally provided by the open source group WSO2, and still remaining open source, Ballerina was formulated with the growth of cloud programmers in mind. I mean, look at how many clouds are out there. Many of its features are focused on cloud native development. Specifically, a very handy aspect of Ballerina is that for every Ballerina program, a corresponding sequence diagram is also created to show software interactions. Now for another Microsoft banger, only two short years ago, Bosk was released by Mark Marin in conjunction with Microsoft. Another open source language, Bosk was influenced by the syntax of TypeScript combined with the programming semantics of JavaScript. Bosk is currently still in development to research and enable automated code reasoning, intermediate representation for easy and highly reliable and well-optimized programs, as well as honing in on cloud-centric development. And as of March 2021, Bosk is on the road to version 1.0. Now for some notable throwbacks of popular programming languages that got some updates. C++11 was released in 2011. C++14 was uh, again released in 2014, and same with C++17. Its older brother C's most recent iteration was C18, released in 2018, and even Fortran saw some nice updates with Fortran 2018. And that has been the brief history of programming languages in the 2010s. I hope you guys all liked that video and found it, you know, somewhat informative and hopefully my British narration voice wasn't too terrible. My name is Michael. I make college advice, career advice, tech, computer science videos. If any of those sound interesting to you, consider subscribing to the channel, liking this video to help you boy out with the YouTube algorithm. And at the end of every video, we do another bad British accent. Check out one of my past videos and my past self would thank you dearly and check out one of my future videos and my future self would also thank you dearly. That's all from me. New backdrop this time. I changed rooms, so hopefully I put some fun stuff up there in the, uh, in the background, so hopefully that's a little bit more uh, engaging, but uh, I'll see you guys. Bye-bye.